I have conducted hundreds of plasma experiments over the last 15 years. What I discovered in these plasma experiments led me to develop a radical new approach to fusion energy that produces no carbon emissions. Since this fusion process is based on my concepts covered in my primer fields videos, I have named this process Primer Fusion. The goal with Primer Fusion is to generate electricity by directly capturing the charges produced when hydrogen and boron fuse. When fused with hydrogen, boron will produce enough energy to power the typical home for less than $10 per month. Since Primer Fusion will not use heat to generate steam to drive a turbine, this also significantly reduces the cost and complexity of the equipment required to produce electrical power. The bottom line is that Primer Fusion will produce electricity for a lower cost than any existing source of electricity and it will do this without producing any carbon emissions. Therefore, Primer Fusion will not require government subsidies or mandates to get people to reduce their carbon emissions. The money people save on their power bills will be all the motivation they need to switch to carbon-free Primer Fusion for all their energy needs. This diagram represents the fusion of a hydrogen proton and boron-11. This process is referred to as a neutronic fusion because relatively few neutrons are produced when these two elements undergo fusion. Here we see a representation of a hydrogen proton and a nucleus of boron-11. When the hydrogen proton and the boron-11 nucleus fuse, they form a highly excited and very unstable nucleus of carbon-12 that almost instantaneously splits into three highly charged helium-4 alpha particles that fly off at high velocities. These highly charged helium-4 alpha particles then collide with the collector to extract the charges, which are then run through a transformer to directly convert them to usable electricity without going through a heat conversion process, such as those used in the typical steam-based power plant. Here we see the basic design of a permafusion reactor. The bottom half of the reactor contains a bowl-shaped magnetic array. As you can see, the top half of the reactor contains another bowl-shaped magnetic array. These unique magnetic arrays are critical to the primer fusion process. In 2014, the United States Patent and Trademark Office granted a patent covering these magnetic arrays. You can find more information on this patent and the permafusion process on our website at permafusion.org. Notice that the axis of each magnet aligns with a common magnetic focal point. All the magnets in these bowl-shaped arrays have the same magnetic pole facing inwards. Therefore, these bowl-shaped magnetic arrays are constructed with all the north magnetic poles facing inwards or all the south magnetic poles facing inwards, depending on the desired effects. The magnets used in these bowl-shaped arrays are high-strength neodymium. The material used for the bowl that holds the magnets should be a non-magnetic material such as plastic or ceramic. On the right side of the screen we see that the plasma reveals a burst of energy at the magnetic focal point. The bowl-shaped array's magnetic field combines the plasma in an area with a venturi-like shape and accelerates the plasma up through the magnetic focal point. Notice that the plasma is spinning very rapidly about its axis.
This image shows the experimental primifusion reactor and the high voltage power supply for the top magnetic pole. The bottom pole's power supply is identical to the top pole power supply, but the bottom power supply is underneath the reactor in this image and hidden from view. Since I could not find commercially available high voltage power supplies that met my requirements, I decided to design and build my own. Here we see the high voltage power supply and the measurement module. The measurement module is a thousand to one voltage divider. By connecting the measurement module to an oscilloscope, you can measure the voltage level, frequency, and waveform of the electricity passing through the plasma. The high voltage power supply and the measurement module are filled with mineral oil to cool the components and provide high voltage insulation. I designed these high voltage power supplies to meet the following specifications. The output voltage will be adjustable from 0 to 75 kilovolts DC in either positive or negative polarity at an adjustable frequency from 10 to 150 kilohertz. The output rating is 100 watts in pulse mode or 30 watts continuous. The output frequencies of the two power supplies can be phase synchronized. Here is what I mean by phase synchronized. Regardless of the output frequencies, the phase relationship between the top bowl and the bottom bowl can be adjusted as shown here. I believe that this will be important to optimize the fusion reaction. The frequency of the top bowl and the frequency of the bottom bowl can be independently adjusted from 10 kHz to 150 kHz. I believe that this may also be important to optimize the fusion rate. So far it appears that the reaction is most effective below 100 kHz, but this needs to be confirmed with further testing. As you can see, there has been a lot of engineering and experimentation to get Primifusion to this point. Using some computer renderings, let's examine some of the Primifusion reactor's construction details. The lower half of the Primifusion reactor contains a bowl-shaped magnetic array that we covered in detail earlier in this video. In the top half of the Primifusion reactor is another bowl-shaped magnetic array. Since the shape of the plasma formation in the Primifusion reactor is not apparent to everyone who views these videos, I have provided this computer animation. As you can see, the plasma in the middle of the Primifusion reactor has a disk-like shape that rotates very rapidly about its axis. In this cutaway view of the Primifusion reactor, the magnetic field vectors are shown using red arrows to indicate a north magnetic orientation and particle flow, and blue arrows to indicate a south magnetic orientation and particle flow. If you have viewed my Primifields videos, you will be familiar with two unique magnetic field structures within the bowl-shaped magnetic arrays that I refer to as the confinement dome, and the flip ring. As the blue arrows indicate, magnetic particles above the confinement dome flow down to the flip ring where they flip magnetically and go under the confinement dome. 
Then the particles are held under the confinement dome until enough energy is applied to force them up through the top of the confinement dome. Once they get above the confinement dome, they accelerate rapidly up the bowl's central axis as indicated by the green arrows. In the top view of the bowl, the confinement dome is shown in magenta and the flip ring is shown in yellow. The green arrows indicate the location of the ejection jet at the top of the confinement dome. Of course, in reality, the confinement dome and flip ring cannot be seen as they are invisible magnetic field structures, but their effects on plasma are very apparent. In this lab video, you can see the obvious glow that occurs right at the flip ring. Once again, notice the location of the ejection jet as indicated by the green arrows. Here I am using some red and blue bar magnets to show the magnetic polarity of the central axis of the bowl-shaped magnetic array. Notice that the magnetic polarity suddenly flips at the top of the confinement dome. This is where the ejection jet begins and any magnetic matter is accelerated rapidly up through the magnetic focal point. Once again, notice the magnetic polarity flip right at the top of the confinement dome. Now I will use red and blue magnetic spheres, with red indicating north magnetic orientation and blue the south magnetic orientation. The confinement dome holds the red and blue sphere from escaping until enough energy forces the sphere above the confinement dome. Once the sphere is above the confinement dome, it accelerates rapidly up and out of the bowl-shaped magnetic array. This area is a unique magnetic zone that does not occur in any other magnetic field arrangement, and what happens in this zone is critical to the permafusion process. At the bottom of the bowl-shaped magnetic array, we have the tungsten electrode inside an alumina ceramic tube. Boron powder was then placed inside the alumina tube. High purity hydrogen gas was then used to purge the reactor vessel before taking it to a high vacuum level. The height of the tungsten electrode and the alumina tube can be independently adjusted. I conducted a large number of experiments to try and determine the optimal location of the tungsten electrode and the alumina tube. When the tungsten electrode was adjusted above the alumina tube as shown here, particles with high velocity were observed. In these freeze frame images, you can see some of these high energy particles. When the tungsten electrode was adjusted even with the top of the alumina tube, the plasma appearance was quite different. The high energy particles were still being generated, but they were mainly trapped inside the alumina tube. In these micrographic images, we see the effects of my testing on the boron powder. Some of the boron powder melted and boron deposits formed on the tungsten electrode. Since boron melts at 2076 degrees C, 
or 3769 degrees F, we can determine that it exceeded these temperatures around the tungsten electrode. But this high temperature was only achieved when the tungsten electrode was at a certain point inside the bowl-shaped magnetic array. Unfortunately, this heat increase also melted some of the polymer components I used to construct the test reactors. This is why in some of the reactor images you see that the bowls are at an angle to each other. Even though I used high temperature polymers that could withstand 200 degrees C to produce the parts I used in the reactor experiments, I knew that melting was a definite possibility. But by using this approach, I was often able to design a component, produce it on my 3D printer, and run it in my vacuum chamber in 24 hours or less. This method enabled me to improve the Primer Fusion Reactor's design much more rapidly than I could have otherwise, even though I knew it meant that parts would melt after a short period of testing. Although the reactor design shown here allowed me to gather a lot of critical information, it is now time to move on to the next phase in the Primer Fusion project. Based on what I have learned from my fusion experiments, I am now building an entirely new reactor that I will show in further detail in my next video, Primer Fusion 3. This new reactor design will use ceramic components that will allow me to run the Primer Fusion reactor at much higher temperatures. This new reactor will also incorporate a new power supply design that will provide 10 times the electrical power to the plasma in the Primer Fusion reactor. I have also made several other design changes in these new power supplies that I believe will increase the fusion rates in the reactor. One other possible improvement in the Primer Fusion reactor would be replacing the neodymium magnets with electromagnets. One advantage to using electromagnets is the ability to turn the electromagnets off and on in any desired pattern and sequence. But I do not believe that electromagnets are necessary, as my past fusion experiments indicate that sufficient magnetic flux density is obtainable with high-strength neodymium magnets. Even so, I would still like to test the permafusion concept using electromagnets, as something new may be discovered during experimentation with such an arrangement. There is still a lot of research, design, construction, and testing to go. But from what I have seen in my experiments thus far, I am highly optimistic that in the near future we will have a source of low-cost energy that produces no CO2 or hazardous radiation. You can learn more about the Primerfusion Project, the Primerfield Foundation, and our goals at primerfusion.org. In the technology transfer area of our website, you will find over 200 megabytes of files available for download free of charge. These files provide all the information needed to produce our patented magnetic arrays and other devices I have designed that emit structured magnetic fields. The Primerfield Foundation has provided the rights to produce these magnetic arrays and some of our other technologies on an open source basis for specific applications. When you visit our website, please donate to the Primerfield Foundation if you are able. Your donations will help further our fusion research, which could truly combat climate change and dramatically reduce energy costs at the same time.